Today's Bible reading is Psalm 47. I also read the introduction. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, a psalm. Clap your hands, O your nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Indeed it is. Thank you, Chris. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, you are the Lord Most High, you are the great King over all the earth. Please fill our hearts with joy in believing and speak to us through this passage of your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Invitation to a celebration, that's what we're looking at today. We Presbyterians though, we are a quiet bunch. We're not into clapping our hands or stamping our feet or cheering and shouting in church, not in general. Our worship services are dignified and respectful. Uh, But to be times, to be honest, we can be just a little bit dull. Which means the physicality of Psalm 47 can be confronting. It's so in your face. It's so emotional. And yet here it is, God is saying to us, turn up the volume, don't hold back, it's time to loosen up those stiff Presbyterian bones, it's time to get happy and make a joyful noise to the Lord. This is an invitation to a celebration, an invitation to a celebration, although it probably wouldn't get the tick of approval from the COVID police. Have a look at verse 6. We saw what happened to the uh, Hillsong Youth Conference this weekend. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Or as I prefer, sing to him praises with understanding. Sing to him praises with understanding. Make a joyful noise because... We've got good news to share as God's people and we want the whole world to hear about it. We don't do that by being silent. We do it by making a joyful noise. So clap your hands, shout to God with cries of joy. I'm just saying Psalm 47 is an invitation to a celebration and today Let's find out what all the excitement is about. First of all, in verse 1, there is an invitation that goes out to all nations. This is not only for the people of Israel. It's for everyone and especially for us Gentiles. And that's the interesting thing about Psalm 47. When you join this party, you'll be called a child of the God of Abraham, even though you're a Gentile. And that's something we'll need to think about a little more later on this morning. So in verse 1 you've got the invitation and then in the rest of the psalm, it's only a short psalm, isn't it? Psalm uh, 47, the rest of the psalm, verses 2 to 9, gives us three reasons to get happy, all of which are related to God's glory. Three reasons to get happy and they're all related to God's glory. And the three reasons are these. First, God's awesomeness as God, that's in verses 2 to 4. Then you've got God's ascension in verses 5 to 7, which may refer to the day when King David brought the ark of of the Lord into the city of Jerusalem. Do you remember that happy day, dancing before the Lord? And finally, 
God's administration or well, God's righteous rule over the nations in verses 8 and 9. So you've got God's awesomeness, God's ascension and God's administration and then we'll come back and think about how this points us all to Jesus before we finish this morning. So there you go. Today we're going to rejoice with all our might before the Lord who is the great King over all the earth. Come on, get happy, put your glad rags on. Enough of these coronavirus blues. You've been invited to God's party and this is my first point for today. We're all invited. We're all invited. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Again, I want you to notice how the invitation is given to all the peoples of the world, all you peoples, all you nations, that is all you Gentile nations. The Psalm 47 was sung by Israel. It was sung in the assembly of God's people, the Old Testament church, but it was sung to remind Israel that they were called by God to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests to light the way for all people everywhere to come and know the Lord. They were to be that shining light in the world. And that's what God is reminding his people in Psalm 47. Psalm 47, though, it does stand out as being particularly generous to the nations. And normally the Gentiles are seen as, well, the enemies of God's people, as idol worshippers who conspire against the Lord and against his anointed one, such as, for example, in Psalm 2. I've got the passage up there. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And that's how the the nations are often seen. There's a very clear distinction between Israel and the nations. And normally the Gentiles are the bad guys, but not in Psalm 47. In Psalm 47 there's an outbreak of peace and the beginnings of a new movement of God's grace. For those who were once called enemies have now been counted as friends. And that's a beautiful thing. Those of the nations who have kissed the sun and acknowledged his reign in their lives are welcomed into God's church and God's family. And isn't that worth celebrating? God says it is. So again, come on, get happy, put your glad rags on. Jews and Gentiles are going to worship the Lord together. So advertise your joy in having been included in this wonderful plan of God. Let everyone know what God has done to bring every tribe and tongue and nation together as one people under Christ. Psalm 47 is definitely looking forward to the day when Jesus will be Lord and King over all and that old dividing wall of hostility will be broken down because all can come to know God through faith in Jesus. That's where this psalm is heading. Shout about it. Don't be shy. Turn up the volume to ten. Let all the peoples clap their hands. Let them make a loud noise to God with joyful voices. Our version translates it as shout, but it's really just make a loud noise, make a joyful noise to the Lord. This is not a psalm for sitting down. It's a full-blooded, heart-pumping call to worship. It's loud, it's proud, it's joyful So let's see how we go later on this morning when we come to our response song. I hope that maybe we can give it some extra oomph today just to put into practice what we're seeing in this psalm. What do you think? In the meantime, let's get on to my next point about the content of God's invitation to come and celebrate. This is about God's glory. This is about the fact that our God is the Lord Most High who is worthy of all praise. It's about him. It's about our God. For he is, what is our God? He is an awesome God in verses 2 to 4. And this is the first of three great reasons for God's people to get happy. He is an awesome God. Look at this. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. 
He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. Our God is an awesome God. But what does it mean to be awesome exactly? What does it mean to be awesome? I mean, these days, you use the word awesome, almost anything can be awesome. A sunset can be awesome. A sporting result can be awesome. Or I've got up here, you know, a hamburger can be awesome. So when we say that God is awesome, do we mean that he's kind of like a hamburger with the lot? Super tasty, super satisfying, super good? Is that what we mean when we say that God is awesome? No, it's not, is it? Not exactly. The basic idea of awesomeness has to do with fear, awe and dread and even terror. He is an awesome God. Changes the meaning, doesn't it? I've never been afraid of a hamburger. But our God is an awesome God. In the presence of God, awesomeness is about fear mixed with respect. To call God awesome is to say, I know that my life is in his hand. He is the most high God. He is the king of all the earth. He is Lord of my life, my creator. He is an awesome God. It's a big word for a big God. So let's break this down a bit further. I'm still looking at verse 2. See, the first thing the psalmist wants us to see in verse 2, the word order in our version has been swapped around. The first thing the psalmist wants us to see is not God's awesomeness, but God himself. God himself. And this is what happens when you walk into the room and you see God for the first time. Whoa, down you go. That's what happens in the Old Testament. People fall as though dead before the presence of this awesome God. You see the Lord Most High. You see Yahweh, the living God, on his throne, majestic in power, infinite in wisdom, perfect in righteousness, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-wise. This is your God and he is awesome. And then you hear his name. Yahweh, the living God, the Lord. Yahweh is the personal name of God. It's the name that God revealed to his people Israel when he covenanted with them to be their God. And in your Bibles you will see the letters L-O-R-D, all in capitals. Well, that's God's personal name. Y-H-W-H becomes in our Bible L-O-R-D all in capitals. It's very closely related to the explanation that God gave to Moses when he said, I am who I am. And God said to Moses, tell the people I am sent them to you, to, sent you to them. So, so God is, I am who I am. He is Yahweh. It means that you can't tell God who to be or what to do. You must come to him on his terms because he is the Lord. He is Yahweh. I am who I am. And he is also called Most High, which translates the word Elion. But Elion is a Gentile word, or rather it's a word that Gentiles would have known and recognised. Whether you were an Assyrian in those days, or a Babylonian, or an Egyptian, you would have understood immediately what it means to call God Elion, to call him the supreme being, to call him most high. It's actually very audacious. It's saying really that there is only one God. You can't have two most high gods. There's only one most high God, right? And this is the Lord. This is Yahweh, Elion, the Lord, most high. Only the Lord is Elion. Only the Lord is most high. He is the ultimate supreme being in whom and through whom all other beings exist. 
And so we begin to appreciate the awesomeness of our God. And it's right that we should, in a sense, tremble before his presence and be awestruck by his majesty, his glory and his power. You get into the book of Revelation and there's this wonderful passage, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of his glory. It's exactly as it should be. For the Lord Most High is awesome the great king over all the earth. That's what verse 2 is teaching us. For the Lord most high is awesome, the great king over all the earth. And this is your God. But now the question is, how can I be joyful in the presence of such an awesome God? And the answer is because he loves me and because he's good. Okay? How can I be joyful in the presence of the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth? Well, because he loves me and because he's good. Israel experienced the joy of being loved by God and so do we today as Christians. We know that in ourselves we're undeserving of the kindness that God has shown us, but here we are. We're forgiven, we're cleansed, we're set free, we're set upon our feet. We don't have to fear when we go into the presence of God anymore because we've been washed in the blood of Jesus. We've been robed in his righteousness and the way is open for us to enter into the throne room of God whenever we want to talk to him in prayer. We are loved by God. And so it was that in the days of King David and King Solomon, God blessed his people richly. He blessed them with great success in the land that he had chosen for them to live in. And this was his kindness to them. They knew it was entirely undeserved. But the great and awesome God, who is the Lord Most High, is a God of covenant faithfulness and his mercy is new every morning. So we have these examples of God's awesomeness in the days of David expressed in terms of God's love for his people in verses 3 and 4. David says, or rather the the sons of Korah, referencing what happened in David's life, he subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. And there again you have that word selah, same we saw it last week. This is a moment to stop and reflect on the awesomeness of our God who loves us. We bring these two things together and we begin to understand the character of God. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. God acts because he loves us. He fights our battles for us. He chooses our inheritance for us. He blesses us in Christ. He fills us with his Holy Spirit. He loves us as only God can. We come into the New Testament. Think of John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that promise stands. The awesome God has loved us in and through his son Jesus. You are greatly loved and that by God. He is the awesome and supreme being. He is Yahweh Elion. So rejoice and be glad in his holy presence today because you are greatly loved by this God. And now the second great reason why we should get happy in Psalm 47 is God's ascension in verses 5 to 7. And again, this seems to be referring to the day when King David brought the Ark of the Covenant up through the streets to the fortress of Zion in the city of Jerusalem. I want you to look at verses 5 and 6. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. It's another beautiful example of Old Testament faith and it should inspire us in our walk with God today. 
It stirs the heart to imagine the joy of the people as they watch the Lord himself leading that great procession through the streets of Jerusalem for the ark of God was carried by the Levites on their shoulders at the head of the company. And David danced before the Lord in that linen ephod and the people shout aloud. And there's trumpet blast, there's noise and there's movement and there's celebration. It was one of the high moments in the entire history of God's people in the Old Testament as they welcome God, the Lord, their king, into his city, into into David's city, that he might be Lord over them. Every six steps, sacrifices were made. And David, wearing that linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets. You can read about it in 2 Samuel 6. It's a wonderful passage. It was a royal enthronement ceremony to show the world that Israel's true king is the Lord and that David is just his human representative. It was a matter of putting God first. And that's what it was reflecting. In Psalm 47, though, we not only look to the past and how God has been uh, exalted and in his ascension in, in that past event, but Psalm 47 looks forward to the future as well. It does look forward to an even more glorious enthronement day, to the day when Messiah comes, when God himself comes to save his people and when Jews and Gentiles will Worship God together with one voice, one heart and one spirit. And when Messiah comes, the good news of salvation will go out to the ends of the earth and all who believe in him will come and worship him in the new Jerusalem. The Lord will reign over us and be our king and Jesus will be seated on the throne forever and ever. And around him will be gathered a great multitude of people from every tribe and tongue and nation under heaven singing praises to the Lord Almighty with great joy. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises to him with understanding. See, this is how the old King James Version uh, treats verse 7 as a call to sing praises with understanding. And I'm attracted to this interpretation of what is a difficult verse. I think God wants us to sing by all means, but to sing with understanding, to sing with understanding so that we can teach one another how to love God and how to serve God as his people today. We are to sing with understanding. We are to praise him with understanding. So by way of application of this thought, it seems to me that you should, parents should sing songs to your children Teach them, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And as they grow, sing them other songs. Parents, sing songs. Sing salvation songs to your children. And we should sing songs to remember the doctrines of our faith, as we do in church. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. And we should sing songs of praise to lift up our spirits when we're down. You know, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. And we should sing songs of adoration to express our love for the Lord. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? Singing songs, songs of joy, is an outworking of faith. As God's people, we should sing to the Lord. We should sing with understanding at church, at home, in the car, on the way to work. We should have a song in our hearts. No matter what's happening in the world around us, we have reason to rejoice. How blessed we are to have been included in the covenant of grace and called children of the God of Abraham. For that is what we are if we are in Christ. And people who are truly happy are people of song. So that's two great reasons we should be happy today. Number one, God's awesomeness as God. Number two, God's ascension as king. They both have to do with God's glory. We're getting our joy out of looking at him. And the third reason to rejoice in our passage today is because of God's administration or God's righteous rule over the nations in verses 8 and 9. 
For we're told God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. The fact that God reigns over the nations is entirely expected in the Old Testament. It's there in verse 8. The fact that he's seated on his throne to be judge and creator, Lord over all, is expected too. But I think it must have come as quite a shock for the people of Israel on a Sabbath morning to sing the next line in their hymn sheets. This is where the nobles of the nations, who are Gentiles, remember, are assembling, as it says, as the people of the God of Abraham. Now, in Old Testament times, those words must have caused quite a stir. And the elders in the synagogue that morning would have scratched their heads and rubbed their chins because this is not what was generally expected. You've got to understand the idea of Gentiles being counted as children of the God of Abraham is a very radical idea. Of course they wanted the Gentiles to be saved. That's not the problem here. But to their mind, how could that happen unless the Gentiles become Israelites first? And yet here it is in verse 9, in black and white. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. It's an extraordinary movement of God's grace, a hint of what is yet to come in Jesus Christ. It really does take us into the realms of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul calls it a mystery that is solved by Christ. How can it be that the Gentiles can be children of Abraham without becoming Jews? Well, it's because our God is the king of all the earth. All the kings of the earth belong to him. He is greatly exalted. He can resolve this because he's God. But only after Jesus died on the cross, only after Jesus made his ascent into glory, could the doors of God's kingdom be thrown open to all so that anyone could enter into a relationship with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul explains it beautifully in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. The doors have been thrown open. The curtain is torn in two. The tomb is empty. Jesus is risen and he is Lord. From now on, even Gentiles can be called children of Abraham because Jesus is our peacemaking king. Once enemies, now friends. Once divided, now united in Christ. That's God's peace in action. Jesus is our peace and even the most hostile of enemies can be reconciled through him. And that's another great reason to be rejoicing today as God's people. So we've seen those three reasons to rejoice. And let's finish now by bringing our focus back to Jesus, who after all is the greatly exalted Lord of Psalm 47. He is the great King over all the earth who has come to us personally so that we can have fellowship with our Heavenly Father. Remember the words of Philippians chapter 2, that section I've put up on the screen for you there. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the answer to the mystery in Psalm 47. Jesus is the mighty, mighty King. He is the greatly exalted Lord of Psalm 47 and so we rejoice as his people today. Or do we? Do we really rejoice in the Lord as we should? I think I have to ask that question as we come to the end of the passage today. I mean, I'm assuming that we rejoice, but do we really rejoice? Do we feel like getting up on our feet and cheering? Is it like, we know, watching the goal that wins the championship for your team? I 
See, here's my point. If Jesus is the mighty, mighty king, if Jesus is my king, and if I've been invited to celebrate his awesomeness, his ascension, his administration, his government of all nations in the world, if I've been called to sing praises to my God with understanding, with joy, shouldn't I at least give it a go? Five times in our psalm today, the psalmist cries out, sing praises. Oh, I don't like singing. Sing praises to our God and King. Sing praises. Everyone should be singing. Oh, I don't like to sing. I feel self-conscious. Oh, don't say you can't sing. Just make a joyful noise. Grunt if you have to. Just grunt joyfully. God wants warm-hearted, passionate, loving children to get excited about his great plan of salvation and your inclusion in it. He wants that we should praise him with understanding, with our minds as well as our hearts. God is not great because we praise him. He is great, therefore we praise him. We've got to get that right. We've got to look to God and recognise how awesome he is and then the excitement will rise within our hearts. Amen? Sing praises to God. It should never be a chore to sing to God. Something's wrong if you don't want to sing to God. For he is worthy of all praise. And he has given us great reasons to rejoice. So let's not squander them. Not today. Not ever. In times like this, Psalm 47 is a great encouragement to shake off the COVID blues. There's quite enough fear and panic going on in the world today without us adding to it and without us being pulled down when we want to be lifted up. You know, I really think one day when this is over we should have a mask burning ceremony at church <laughs> and we should dance on them <laughs> in the name of the Lord. Set me free, O oh Lord. How can Christians shake off the COVID blues and other things that trouble us in life? I think sometimes you have to decide in yourself to change your outlook. You have to decide how do you view life? How do you view the world? Are you going to be going around all mopey and sad and oh, I might die tomorrow or I might kill granny or whatever it is that's worrying you? you know, okay, we take care of one another but we don't live in a de- depression. No wonder suicide rates are so high. Poor all them people have got no hope. They've got no Lord. They've got no saviour. They've got nothing to look forward to. They're caught up in these little panic balls and we have the Lord. Why are we living like them? Remember, you are greatly loved by God. You have to decide who you're going to stand with and how you're going to live or they're going to take your life from you one year after another. First two years, then three, then four and then what? How are you going to break free of the tyranny that is being placed upon us as people today? I ask you, remember who God is. You are greatly loved by an awesome God. And remember that the kings of the earth belong to him. Whatever's happening today is God's ordained judgment upon us and yet we can still rejoice in the midst of it. Therefore God's people should be confident and joyful in Christ. And I want to finish by reading to you again Psalm 47 before we sing with joy our response song. Psalm 47 for the director of music of the Sons of Korah, a psalm. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with, with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. 
God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Thank you, music team. Let's sing.